Africa Prime, brought to you by Jamison Select Reserve. And we're speaking to Professor Tandi Kamkandawire. He is a professor for African Development at the London School of Economics. So we're picking his brain tonight to try and get a sense of how Africa can actually put in place the right policies, the right institutions, and ensure that from now on, we never talk again about Africa being the least development continent on the world. Professor, when we took a break, you were talking about how we are missing two things. One, the institutions to help us build, uh, to take advantage of the current uh, conditions. And secondly, political order, you were saying, is of primary importance in ensuring that investors uh, 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 get the assurances that you need. In my mind, I was thinking, what you're saying is actually, you don't need democracy. You need a benevolent dictatorship. Would that work? No, uh, for Africa, <laughs> you know, uh, no. I'll tell you why. <laughs> the, 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 uh, first of all, just normatively, I am against dictatorships. So I, 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 <laughs> I don't normally spend much time thinking about how to strengthen dictatorships. <laughs> but um, the fact of the matter in Africa, we have many democracies. Right. So, uh, and I think the challenge is to how to make these democracies perform you know, a developmental role. Secondly, our, you know, when people look at the relationship between development and, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and democracy, it used to be argued in the old days that there was a trade-off, you know, if you have, you know, that you can't have, a, you know, you have first you have to have a development and then you have a democracy. Right. P that people cannot eat, you cannot eat democracy. Yeah. And all that, you know. They need food on the table, and if yeah. the military and, dictator and, uh, provides it, yeah, you're exactly. Okay. And the people should point out to East Asia and say these are, you know, dictatorships and they're doing very well. Mm. And they were, and most of these states that were development were authoritarian. Malaysia. Yeah. And the only ones that were, ironically, that were listed as democratic. The, the, uh, uh, the two of them were African, okay, it was Mauritius and Botswana. Right. So it turns out that when you look at the relationship between growth and, and democracy uh, and poli politics in Africa, it turns out in Africa, just generally, uh, the dictatorship is negative. So it may be that in other parts of the world, authoritarian rule is good. I, I, don't, I, I don't believe that. But I am quite sure that it's bad for Africa. It is not good. No. And we have had good, we have a, a good record of dictatorships that do it very badly. Okay, so let's try and provide some of the solutions. Then, what is the answer? Is it a government that comes in and guides the development, or is it a government that facilitates conditions for business to flourish and therefore employ people and push up development? Well, states, you know, the, the governments have played all kinds of roles. You know, from purely re regulatory roles to uh, you know, entrepreneurial roles when the state actually owns enterprise. They, yeah. I mean, there, there's no limit. I mean, that debate is ongoing here in South Africa. Yeah, I mean, I would be open, just be open about it. You know, if, if there are sectors where there's no response from the private sector, yeah. for all kinds of reasons, the state has stepped in. And, and it's not only, uh, we, 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 when people talk about states in Africa, it's because of the language that came from the crisis. Uh, we see them as inherently inefficient. Right. Uh, but as I said, this article in The Economist was pointing out that you know, some of the big enterprises from China that we're seeing here, these are state enterprises, you know, but they're playing the market game. Okay? Mm. I think mm. the big mm. difference in the parastatos in Africa, uh, you know, of the 60s and 70s, many of them were, you know, were just very, very highly protected and they, they right. never faced the market, you know, uh, uh, market challenge. Yeah. But you know, there is no rule about whether you should you know, focus only on the uh, you know entrepreneurial role of the state or in, in or uh, in the regulators. So the state could be as good as business. You're saying? Oh yeah, if the sectors where this business cannot. In Africa, is it possible? You know oh the yeah, conditions. Yeah. You know the politicians. You know where we're coming from. You know our legacies. I mean, look, one of the strange things, one of the companies that was a big success in our neighborhood here was the Press Corporation in Malawi. Yeah. So, you know, you know, and it was run on, uh, along so-called market lines, but it, but it was basically state, a state it enterprise. It was a government entity. You yeah. can do it. I mean, it, it's the rules. What economic theory tells you is is that what matters is the, the rules of the, you know, whether it's competition or no competition. If it's a private company and it's a monopoly, it's as equally of a headache, if not more, than a state monopoly. So it lies in the rules, you're saying? In the rules of the, of the game that you're playing, or whether, in fact, this state enterprise is subjected to you know, to the test of the market, and yeah, that, and, that. Yeah. Uh, and and that you know, it, it you can have a large enterprise which is private enterprise. As is, uh, I think South Africa is one of the South African uh, South Africa's big problem, which are huge conglomerates that are not subject to any comp to serious competition. Mm. Then you're stuck too. You know, mm. so it's mm. Mm. Uh, the the game for, for see Africa is we have one big advantage we must exploit. We are the late, late, late industrializers, right? 
Now, development, to me, if you're late industrialized, means leapfrogging. Right. Okay. How do you do that? You learn whatever they've done, but you don't repeat what they've done. You know, you leapfrog. What did they've done wrong? Yeah, you skip that stuff. And some of the things that they did well, but did were too slow about them, you take them on. So okay. um, I think we've now learned that democracy does not hinder. Uh, people thought that it was. I'm sure in the 60s, people like Nyerere were convinced that one party state was the way to go. Mm. We now have enough evidence saying that it's not true. Okay. So we, we, we don't have to, uh, you know, uh, and we know that authoritarian rule is not the only solution. I mean, there, there's enough historical experience of exceptions to those rules sure. that we can pick up and, and, and you know, and, and, and go and, and have a, a path of, de of development that has not been witnessed by anybody else. Okay. Uh, you know, there's okay. nothing to When you look at Africa's news friends, you look at India and you look at China and you look at the models that they've deployed in Africa. Yes. Sir. Two diff very, very different. The Chinese are coming in state-owned and private sector in some cases, yes, yes. whereas the Indians is <laughs> primarily private sector led. Yes, yes. Which is the right approach for us? For us? For us. No, for us, it's a matter of indifference, really, it doesn't matter. You know? um, it's, it's how we regulate them, I mean, uh, whether they're state or not. I mean, we, we, they, they have to be subjected to our laws, our rules, and, our, and, and they should be, you know, and they should be, we should think of them as being embedded in our own strategies of, the, of, of development. Now, whether they're private or public, that's not really, that's their headache. Right. <laughs> yeah. Right. Now, when, when they come in, uh, let's, let, let's take the, the, the case of China, for instance. Yes. Are African governments handling the entry of the Chinese business people and state corporations onto the continent the right way? I think somebody was saying, uh, you know, China may have a strategy for Africa, but Africa has no strategy for China. You know? that's, that's, that's actually true. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. So what, what should be our strategy? And in many cases, I've been surprised, and actually uh, I've talked talk to some Chinese scholars, they have been surprised by the sort of things that we have asked the Chinese government for. Yeah. Is there an African country that is a right strategy for China, in your view? You know, strange enough, I once thought the Congo might be ha one having it, because the, Cong you know, the Congo has... In spite of all the chaos. <laughs> yeah, because they, they've decided to use all their money for... Well, they, they, they want... They, they, they entered this huge agreement for infrastructure. You know. and, and this is quite unusual for Congo, hi given its history, you know, that mm. they would actually, if it happens, that so much money would be spent on infrastructure. Yeah. But actually, uh, which many countries in Africa are behaving differently, and so one cannot say. Uh, but I do know cases where Chinese have said, uh, why are people asking us for stadiums, you know, and, and five-star hotels? I mean, why can't mm. they ask for things that are productive, you know? Right. Like roads, like railways. Yeah, roads and, and industrial thing. parks, or things like that, you know. But why, why are we, go, you know, we, you go for five-star hotels and, you know, uh, um, uh, you know, conference centers, and you know that that the Chinese are puzzled by that sometimes. <laughs> Prof, <laughs> but they, but they don't interfere. We need to talk about where you have been, but I need to ask you before we we, we begin talking about that. Mm. Uh, when you look at the Africa growth story now, how long do you see it continuing? To the extent that raw materials are playing an important role, it uh, it can last long actually, but the projections for raw materials demand are quite favorable for, Af for Africa. Um, and, and for some miraculous reasons, there's a now a, a spate of huge discoveries, you know, which makes you wonder what, you know, whether in fact they're really discoveries, but they're just <laughs> too big to have been hidden all these years. You know? um, so it can go on for a long term. But I, w but I, I would, again, once one uh, uh, advise Africa that even if that happens, we ought to invest huge amounts of money in creating skills to deal with my, uh, raw materials. Countries have developed with raw materials, so the US, Australia, yeah. Canada. So you can do it. Yeah. It's not a curse. You know, people say they talk the resource curse. It's not always a, a curse. But if you don't manage it well, it can be a real curse. Okay. And one of the things, and I think we can even learn from the Arabs. You know, the Arab countries have now managed, they, they manage the oil industry. They manage the finances from the oil. So it's institutions, you have to invest it's your resources, it's your skills. Yeah, yeah, your skill, yes, yes. Okay. Skill. Now, let me presumptuous and say, you're an African yes. resident in London. Yes. How did you get there? By a very roundabout way, I mean, <laughs> I, <laughs> which has included uh, studying in the U.S. and being living Africa at the age of ten, yeah, eleven. Uh, yeah, I left uh, Africa on twenty-one years old, and then being stuck in a. You know, I was in the you know, U.S. and then I ended up with my professor in Latin America, and then I couldn't go back to the U.S. because my passport was no longer valid. Malawi government had <laughs> revoked my passport. I ended up in Sweden, where I was a refugee, and went continued studying there. Taught, decided that I didn't have to wait for for banded to go <laughs> for me to go back to Africa. I could yeah. go somewhere else in Africa and I got a, an opportunity to go to Senegal 
where I spent 30, 13 years. Yeah, you were telling me that you actually went to Senegal for three months yes, and then it ended up on being a 10-year uh, stay. And while there, I did a, a, a two-year stint in Zimbabwe to, uh, when they were setting up the Zimbabwe Institute. When was that? This was 80, 81, 83. What were you doing there? It was uh, to help set up this uh, Zimbabwe Institute of Development Studies. I do remember ZIDs. Yes, and, and you know, we just produced some interesting uh, scholars. Some of the leading scholars from Zimbabwe from that are still from, the, uh, from that, you know, some Moyos. Uh, it doesn't look like it worked because all those scholars were out there now. And how, how come they were not uh, involved in trying to save the country from where it ended up? You know, one of the big problems in African post-colonial history, that African states have never been able to develop an organic link with the intelligentsia. The yeah. only nationalist movement that I know of that yeah. did that in Africa yeah. was the Africana nationalists. Yeah, in South Africa. Yeah. They had the, the link between, and that's a story which has to be, to be told one Absolutely day. Absolutely on its the own. The story about the intellectual underpinnings of apartheid has never been really discussed fully. You know? and, but anyway, there was a link between the, the intelligence here, you know, and the... And the you know. When are you coming back? I'll be back in May. So. We're coming back to Africa, I mean. I mean, for completely for good. For good. You can't continue living in London. You have to come back. No, no, let's come back. I mean, I, you know, I, uh, this I miss the continent very much. I mean, it's um, it, it's been intellectually my the center of my my focus or research has been the, this continent, and every small invitation I get to Africa, I, I rush and take it. I, I hope my my LSE uh, post is the last abroad. You know, I would like to come and do something in, in Africa and. And when I give, I was yesterday I gave a lecture to uh, Vitz, and it, it was exciting to get a positive response from this. From the, uh, I'm certainly African looking scholars. forward to the time when you come back and you come back for good. But <laughs> the next time you also come back temporarily, we must talk about African nationalism and how we've been unable to merge African nationalism with intellectualism and be able to debate and follow up things and get things done without being at each other's throats and picking up pangas and all those yes, other kind yes. of things. We've been, you've been speaking to Professor Tandi Kamkandawire. He is Professor of African Development at uh, the London School of Economics. You've been watching Africa Prime. Good evening.